We started several months ago a series on the 70 most difficult questions in Judaism. Tough topics, difficult to understand, some of them very metaphysical in nature. We spoke about creation, evolution, the various parts of the human being, including his soul, the nefesh, ruach, and the neshama. We spoke about free will, mazalot, astrology. We went on to soulmates. And now we're going to speak about something a little bit different that has a little bit to do with kohot ara, the impure forces, which is another topic that we discussed. Why did HaKadosh Baruch why did God create the impure forces in this world? The koh and the Zat Hashem will also be speaking about reincarnation. But tonight follows a, perhaps a, uh, an example of what Kohot Ara is. Even though I a little bit explained what Kishuf is, what witchcraft is, why these things were created for, why do they exist, why are they allowed to, to cause harm. Tonight's topic is going to be a little bit more familiar because most of you are more familiar, more, heard a little bit more about Ainara, the evil eye, much more than Kishufim, witchcraft, sorcery, black magic, and the like. And eventually we'll talk about another related topic, is why is it that there's so much evil in this world that what appears to us is that the righteous suffer and those who are evil prosper? Why are there illnesses, disease, it's pretty much all similar, all related, but each one has to be dealt with separately. Ainara, evil eye, is something very, very unique that both Sephardim and Ashkenazim are familiar with. Some are more in tune than others. Some are more sensitive to it. Nevertheless, it is something that we need to be a little bit aware of. And that's why we're going to talk about it tonight. What exactly is the Ainara, the evil eye that so many people are scared of? and wear all sorts of amulets, including the red string, right? We'll talk all about that tonight. But we first have to give an introduction about this topic. What is Tob and what is Ra? Many of us are familiar with the concepts of good and bad, but we don't really understand what they are. Because in human terms, what is good for me may not be good for you. In other words, good is something which is relative. If it's good for me, it may not be good for you. If it's bad for you, it may not be fat, bad for me. So these concepts are really relative. What we're interested to know is what is the ultimate good. The ultimate good is discussed in Parshat Bereshit in the very beginning of creation when Hashem created the world. He says about many things that He made, Kitov, they are good. Why does he have to tell us they're good? Isn't it obvious if he makes them they're good? When God makes something good, he makes it perfect. So the tov, the ultimate good, is something which is perfect or complete. It's something that serves the ultimate purpose. The mesharet et In other words, it's useful. He designed it for a purpose. And the tov lekulam. It's good for everyone. So when Hashem says something is good... It means it's perfect, complete. It serves the purpose, the ultimate purpose, the tachlit of why this world was created for, and it's good for everyone. What about Ra? Then what is evil? What is bad? Well, we first have to keep in mind that anything that is bad does not come from Him. As the Pasuk says, Mi pi elyon araot. As we read in the Megillah of Echa, on Tisha Be'ar, Yirmiyahu says, from above nothing bad comes down, because Hashem is all good. So there's nothing bad coming down from Him. Even though certain things come down from Him that appear to be bad, it's because it is our perception that tells us that they're bad, but they're all good. But nevertheless, there is something negative and bad in this world, but it's man-made. Usually it's man-made, uh, unless we talk about the evil forces. So that which is bad in this world is the exact opposite of good. If good is something that is complete and perfect, then what is bad? Something incomplete, something which is lacking. Okay? 
something which ultimately, of course, serves the purpose, the big picture of the creation, but in its operation, bad is negative. It's not positive. So if we're talking about bad right now, we're not talking about punishments. We're not talking about illness and disease, because that comes from above, too, in a sense. If it's meant to be, then it's part of the package deal, part of one's mazal. It could be a tikkun, a kapara, an atonement, and so forth. And eventually we'll talk about that, we'll elaborate about what use is it, and what does it serve, what is it meant to accomplish when one becomes ill, you know, what is it supposed to be. But the real bad that we're talking about is man-made, something that happens down here below, something which demonstrates lacking, it's incomplete, it's not perfect. Hashem is all good, all right? And therefore, everything that He created and everything that He brings into this world at all times, as we call it in Hebrew, is shefa, is abundance, is love. There are many various terms to describe Hashem's actions in this world. In the Kabbalah, there's actually various sefirot, various attributes of God and how He communicates and how He manages this world in all the various midot, regardless of the the various shades and colors, if we can call it that, of his midot, his attributes, they're all good. Even something which is din, which means judgment, is all good. However, as we explained in the past, Hashem did allow, even though he does not bring bad into the world, he allows it to exist. And how does he allow it to exist? Well, he created man, the human being, and this man, this human being, he did not make perfect. And that is why when he finished creating man, he does not say about man, this man is good. Well, he could be a monster. Why should he say good? It's a baby, they're all cute. But let's see what he does with himself. So man is the only one basically where God does not say, this is good. Even though everything Hashem made is good, this creation of mine called man, called the human being, he or she is going to determine in their life whether they were going to be good or bad. They're going to make that decision. How are they going to do that? They're going to be very, very different than all the rest of creation, the rest of, the, of animals, planets, and stars. They're going to be given free will. Choice. You do what you want. Not everything what you want, but certain things you'll be given the liberty, the freedom to do what you want. And if that's the case... Because the human being consists of two parts, as we explained, the physical body and the neshama, well, it's going to be hard to decide what to do. Because the neshama is good. It's part of Hashem. Helek eloka mimaal. It is something divine. The neshama only wants to do good. It is pure. The goof, however, the physical material body wants everything for itself. It wants to eat, sleep, enjoy life, have a good time. That's what the physical body is all about. That's the nature of the physical body. You can't change that. So there, was, there is a constant struggle between the physical body and the neshama to do the right thing. What is the right thing? What Hashem would like us to do, all mankind, Jews and non-Jews. And that is to preserve this beautiful world, to keep it going, to keep it running, to follow His instructions. That would be doing good. But man, because he has free will, can sometimes do bad. It can sometimes cause harm. And that is where the Ra stems from. That is where it comes from. Man, throughout his life, has the ability, however, to perfect himself. As the Kabbalah explains, that is partly the explanation of why we circumcise our children at eight days old. What's circumcision all about? Something extra? A piece of flesh that is there extra? What do you mean Hashem does not make us perfect? Why did he create this piece that he wants us to remove? It is very much symbolic. It's a reminder that man, you are the one that has to remove it. You are the one that has to complete yourself. You're the one that has to do certain actions to perfect yourself. So I'm going to leave that for you to do. Well, obviously the baby cannot do it, so the parents do it for him. But at least part of the explanation of the Brit Milah is to remind us that we're not perfect, but we can be Better, we can perfect ourselves, and that is basically 
what life is all about is to perfect ourselves and to do whatever he expects of us to do. We all have a mission. And even though it's not easy, but we are given the tools to succeed. Nobody can ever complain to God after he leaves this world. You did not give me the tools. It was just too, too difficult for me. I couldn't do it. It was too harsh. I was unemployed, etc. Shem has many, many examples of individuals who risked their life, who sacrificed everything, who were poor, who were ugly, who were beautiful, rich and poor, who lived a beautiful life. So nobody can ever come up with any excuse of why he, he could not do a good job. But obviously we have the Yetzirah and the Yetzirah Tov, the evil and the good inclinations, who are always trying to get us to join their camp, respectively. And if we don't have the instructions, if we don't have the manual, we're going to be confused. Our conscience is going to tell us one thing, and guess what the conscience is? The conscience is a neshama. Deep down we know this is wrong. That's the neshama, that's the yetzerah But our physical body or our bias is telling us something else. So we're sometimes confused. And if we don't have direction, how are we going to know right from wrong? So that is what the Torah is all about. And the Zat Hashem, at another time, we'll talk about what the purpose of this Torah that we have, that we follow, is all about. But I'm just giving you a little bit of a clue now. It is a roadmap on how to live this in this world. Just like you buy a piece of uh, equipment, and hopefully it comes with a manual. It may be written in Taiwanese, not in good English, right? But I think most of us will be able to figure it out how to make the computer work, how to make the dishwasher work. You know, without it, we're, we're not going to at least know how to best take advantage of this very sophisticated piece of equipment. And the human being is quite sophisticated. Life is somewhat complex. And if you don't have direction, you will not be maximizing your time right. So briefly, in this world, because man has free will, he has the ability to do mitzvot and ma'asim tovim, good deeds. And in this way, he builds the world, preserves the world. He's a partner in creation. Or he has the choice, the ability to do avonot, to commit sins, transgressions. And what do they do? They cause a kilkul. They cause a short circuit in the, in the system, in this creation. They go against the will of God. They do not accomplish what was intended to accomplish. On the contrary, they are destructive. Avonot, whichever they may be, and the non-Jewish world has seven, if they're not observed properly, they cause problems, they cause us a lot of trouble. Whereas mitzvot and ma'asim tovim, not only are we doing what is expected of us, we're actually doing something good and beneficial to this world. In the same way that mitzvot and ma'asim tovim allow the shefa, the abundance, to flow, to continuously flow from above to below, avonot, the sins, cause a machsor, or a gira'on, they cause a shortage of the shefa. Whenever there is famine, lack of rain, trouble, epidemics, it is the exact opposite of shefa. It is a lack of abundance. It, if anything, it is destructive. That is a mirror image of human beings' behavior. Because everything in this world, as the Kabbalah explains, is everything is midah, keneg midah. It's measure for measure. We have to have some signals and some sort of communication to us from him I mean, he doesn't talk to us. He doesn't send us an email, right? There's no chat mode with him. How is he going to tell you that something is wrong? Well, one way he does it, when we don't have prophets, I mean, when we had prophets, it was prophets, but we don't have prophets today. He does it through nature. We break our laws, nature breaks its laws. In other words, if something is not right in nature, in the functioning of this beautiful, perfect world, remember we just said the world is perfect? Wow! What are all these winds? What are all the hurricanes? What are all the earthquakes for? Where is this perfect world? Well, if man is not perfect, how is he gonna, ever going to know that he's doing something wrong? So we have this system built in that communicates to us if we're willing to listen. Not everybody listens. It's intended on a global scale and on a, also on an individual scale. The Zat Hashem eventually will talk about it. How is one supposed to know that what is happening to him individually in his personal life is a coincidence, which there aren't any, there are no coincidences. What I really mean is it part of the mazal, that's it, I was born with this package deal, or is it perhaps because of some accusation against me, something that I specifically did just yesterday or a month ago or a year ago 
Now it's haunting me. Now it's coming after me. How am I supposed to know what it is? Maybe it's in the genes? Right? What is it? So there are ways that one can figure out what is happening to him. Now, we spoke about good deeds and sins. Okay, what is the source of a sin? Where does it all begin? How does it uh, form? Rabbis tell us there are two agents of sin. The eyes and the heart. The eyes see, the heart covets, and after the two join forces, the hands and feet complete the job, whatever the sin is. The eye is more dangerous than the heart, because if the eyes would not see, then the heart would not cover it. In Kriyat Shema we say, Lotaturu right? The Torah warns us, be careful not to go by what your eyes see and by what your heart, heart covets or wants. But wait a minute, it should have said it the other way around. It should be the eyes were the ones to see first, and then the heart covets. But in the Kriyat Shema it says just the opposite. Don't go after what your heart desires and what your eyes see. So which one comes really first? It appears to be that the Torah is telling us the heart is first, right? Or is it the eyes first? Which one is it? We would think the eyes come first. The Torah reveals to us the heart is where everything is sown. In other words, the seeds are in the heart. Why? Because you would not see if you did not have the curiosity to see, to look. So it first begins in the heart. then If you would not have the desire, the curiosity to see, then you wouldn't see. Nevertheless, even though it all began in the heart, and the heart has many, many interests and desires and wants, nevertheless, the more dangerous one of the two is the, are the eyes. They are the eyes that are the ones that cause us most of the trouble. Why is that? The rabbis tell us that it's dafka is dafka, in other words, mostly through the agent called the eye that the yetzara gets all its power from. And rabbis tell us, The yetzara would not have any control if the eyes would not first see what they're, whatever it is that they're seeing. So somehow, it is the eyes that engrave in themselves a picture of what they see out there, and that is what leads them to have certain desires. Blind people, I mean, I think there have been various tests conducted about it, are not necessarily going to have the exact same desires as those who can see, because they can see. And we're not talking here about desires or physical needs. If you are hungry, the body is going to let you know. It's going to sound an alarm that you need to eat or drink. We're not talking about bodily needs right now. Where the eye sees and where trouble begins from the eye is the area of, I guess you can call it spiritual needs, but it's not really spiritual. These are needs that are not really part of the body. They're more part of the spirit. For example, I'll give you an example. Kavod, honor. Honor is not a bodily need. The people who want to be respected and honored According to the Kabbalah, kavod is a problem that the ruach in, has, not the nefesh. The nefesh is that spirit that is closest to the physical body, to the heart. The ruach is a little bit higher, the neshama is higher than all of them. The ruach is the one that, or the ruach part of the nefesh, if you want to be more uh, exacting, the ruach is the one that has this need to be respected or to be honored. So we're not talking about real physical needs, we're talking about out-of-body needs. Needs that many of us uh, feel we, we want to have, we crave, like money. Money is not a physical need, right? It's more of an aspiration, it's more something that gives us security, right? It's not a physical need, right? So all of these needs that are, that are not physical, but are nevertheless needs, are in the eye. So the eye is the one that, generate, that generates a hisaron. 
more than the heart, it is the one that generates the feeling of lacking. It is lacking something. It wants something. Because it sees, it sees what other people have. It sees what there is out there in the world. Right? It creates or it generates this sense of wanting to have these things that it sees. Rabbis tell us something incredible. Before a person leaves this world, he sees the angel of death. Now, the angel of death can come in many, many forms. But some people will see him as full of eyes. Malach HaMavet Male'inayim, they tell us. And not everybody sees him as full of eyes, but some will see him. In various situations, you may be able to see that, but usually before one's death. And that usually comes to people who were very much coveting all their life. The eye was coveting, so they see right before they, they leave this world, what are you going to do with all that your eye, all this life coveted? You're not taking anything with you. All of your, all of your mistakes, if not the majority of them, were because of what your eye saw and because of what you wanted that may not have been good for you. So the Yetzera, or actually the Malach Mavit, the angel of death, appears as something that is full of eyes, meaning that the source of all evil, the source of all problems, is all the source of man's downfall, his mistakes, his evil doings, is all from this eye that has been wanting to have certain things. What's so special about the eye? Why does everything really happen through the eye? What, if we talk about now the organ, the eye, what's so unique about the eye? Well, the eye, you may have heard, is the window to the soul, right? Halon l'neshama. You can actually tell a lot about a person by looking at his eye. And it has also been proven that a lot of one's illnesses in the physical body can be seen in the eye. They can also be seen in the, one's fingernails. If you know how to read fingernails, I mean, there is something like that. There's not so much to read into them, but certain lack of vitamins, certain problems in the physical body can be detected in the fingernails and they can very much be detected in one's eye, various parts of the eye. Now, it is very interesting that the Zohar brings down that this eye has the entire world in it. The entire world is in the eye. Where? For those of you who have studied the anatomy of the eye, the white part of the eye, as it's called in, in the anatomy of the eye, is called the sclera. Right? You would know. The sclera, the white part, represents the ocean. The ocean, the waters of the oceans, are more abundant than the earth and the continents, right? The iris which is the, the round part of the eye, which is either blue, green, brown, which help to open up the pupil. The muscles in the iris are the ones that expand, contract, to allow the light to go in through the black pupil. That's, what it's, that's the iris, okay? The iris represents the yabashot, the continents, the earth. And the pupil, the black dot, you can say either represents man, or as the Zohar says, represents Yerushalayim, or another version says it represents the Bet HaMikdash, the center of the earth. There are various opinions as to what each one represents. And there's also room for explaining what the cornea is, which is another part of the, of the front of the eye, as opposed to the many things that exist in the back of the eye. Anyway, Every organ of the human body is representative of something in this world and has tremendous symbolism, but the eye is very, very special. And actually, it just reminds me that of all creations in this world, the one that gave the most difficulty to Darwin, who believed in evolution, was the eye. He says, the eye gives me a lot of trouble. It doesn't let me sleep. In other words, it, that one I can't explain through evolution because it's such an incredible piece of machinery. I mean, the, a camera works like an eye. An eye works like a camera, however you want to say it. 
It's incredible. How could this all happen by itself? There's exactly six muscles from the back in everyone's eye, except for, I mean, not everyone. When I say everyone, I don't mean vultures and dolphins, because their eyes are, even though they're similar, they're not exactly the same. Exactly the same amount of muscles, exact same retina, exact same uh, optic nerve that takes the picture and that is upside down and, and communicates it to the brain and focuses. I mean, it's an incredible piece of machinery, this eye. So it's, it was giving them a hard time, the evolutionists. And we know, of course, that everything was designed by Shen. This is the ultimate design. I mean, this is an incredible piece of, of machinery. So anyway, so it is through this eye that many images are engraven, good and bad. This eye is very, very sensitive. Why is it sensitive? Because the same eye that we just said before reveals to us a little bit about the personality of this individual. It is also through the same eyes that expressions of feelings and emotions, sadness, happiness, crying, all of this comes out through the eyes. An incredible organ that tells us a lot about the person and tells us a lot about how he's feeling. So now that we have an idea of how, of how important this eye is, we also have to realize that this window of the soul is a very sensitive organ. In what way? I'm not talking about dust right now coming into the eye. Sensitive to what it sees because of, of the impression. Everything is recorded. Things that you have seen when you were two years old, you may remember. Two years old. You were just two years old and you remember them better than what you did yesterday. They're engraved. So this sensitive organ, you know what sensitivity it has? This window to the soul, even though it's a window to the soul, it has tremendous sensitivity to this physical material world. That is, after all, where we're living. We're living in a physical material world. And this eye, that is the go-between, the window between the soul and the outer world, it is very sensitive to what it sees. It just, you know, takes a look at whatever it sees and records. And because it records everything, it causes the human being all sorts of problems. This eye, as we said before, the first thing it does is it generates a sense of wanting, of something is missing. It sees something, it wants it. It would like to have it, it would like to try it out. That is one of the things that the eye does when it sees and records an image. But besides all the wants and desires, the most important one of all, the most important observation of all is that we need to know and be concerned about is how the eye looks at the world in general. It's observation of how it sees life and people. Is it an optimist? Is it uh, happy, wanting to contribute, wanting to go along and cooperate? Is it a positive eye or is it a negative eye? It sees everything enviously, wanting everything for itself, not wanting to share. Does it look at life as something depressing and sad? So that is more important than anything. This very sensitive organ, because of a sensitivity, we want to be sure that it looks correctly at life and not in the incorrect way. God forbid, I mean, if somebody commits suicide, he obviously looked at things not in the correct way. He thought he could run away from his problems. But you, can, you, don't, you don't run away from the problems. The, the problems will go after you to the grave. They only get it worse. But it, it definitely has to do with one's perception. And that's, that is where it is very, very sensitive because we only have 70, 80, maybe 85 years to make up our mind how we want to see this world. And of course, we're given direction. If we're given the proper direction and we go hand in hand with this and we believe in it, then we will do just fine. We may have our depressing moments, our sad moments, after all, I mean, that's what life is. It has its ups and downs. 
But if our overall perception is good and positive, then we'll be, we will be fine. If not, then we're asking for trouble. And that's, what, that's where Ayn Hara begins. All of this was one big introduction. But it was necessary for you to understand the dynamics of the eye of good and evil, and how sensitive this organ is, and how some people choose to be positive, and some people choose to be negative. And that is where the trouble begins with those who are negative. What's the difference between those who are positive and those who are negative? Those who are positive are not necessarily interested in themselves. Why? Those who demonstrate a positive eye, they share a midah of a Kadosh Baruch of God. And that is, Enapikiha. Hashem has not a physical eye, because He's not physical, but His eye looks down to this world with compassion, with love, trying to do everything right. I mean, Hashem does everything right, but to supervise the world. Enapikiha. Enapikiha means an always constant eye looking out for creation. If Hashem would remove his supervision for one moment, he would cease to exist. So Hashem's inapekiha, his open eye, his supervising eye, his generous and good eye is always there. Those who are positive about life share that kind of an eye, that kind of a feeling of wanting to help, of wanting to cooperate, of wanting to do Hashem's will, of just showing a a certain positiveness about this creation, about this life that they have. Whereas somebody who has a negative eye, exact, the exact opposite, does not think of giving to others, only thinks of himself. A negative eye only sees himself. He does not see the world. That is why in Hebrew, there's a term called sarut ayn. Sarut ayn means the narrow eye. What is a narrow eye? Does anybody here know the difference between somebody who is stingy and somebody who is a miser? They are very similar, but they are very different. Somebody who is stingy can have steak, live in a beautiful home, have three cars, but not give anything to anybody, not share his wealth with others because he's stingy, right? A miser does not even allow himself to enjoy, even though he has millions of dollars in his bank account. It's a sickness. I mean, it's, 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 but there are people like that. That's a miser. Tsarut Ain. But there's something else. That's not really Tsarut Ain so much. But I give you an example of perhaps somebody who's narrow even on himself. Real Tsarut Ain, the real narrow of the eye, is seen in the following way. We all know what jealousy is. He has that. I want to have it too. Okay? The narrowness of the eye or tsarut eye means I don't want him to have what he has. Anilomefargemlo, as we say in Hebrew. That is worse than jealousy. Jealousy just means whatever he has, I want to have. Okay. It's not the best thing in the world. He has Alexis, I want to have Alexis, not me, right? Kin'a, jealousy. A lot of people are jealous. You know what Sarut Ayn is? I'm not happy for what he has, even though I have the same thing that he has, or even though I don't want what he has. I don't want him to have what he has. You know people like that? There are people like that. That's Sarut Ayn. That means that I that we're talking about, look, look, at, look at what we're saying. Everything is about the I. It's not a generous eye, it's not a positive eye, it's a negative eye. How is it negative? It's being narrow. What is it doing by being narrow? It's not wanting people to be happy. He or she is not happy themselves. They could be envious, they could not want something good for the other. All of that is more or less the same. They could be miser even about themselves. Narrowness of the eye. Uh, now, even though we said before that this eye generates a lacking a sense of lacking, of wanting, it also does something else. Where good is something that is generous and giving and expansive, bad is constrictive, bad is limiting, bad is wanting. So it's all, though, it's all that. It's not just a lacking. It's not only a sense of wanting. It's a sense of limitation, 
of unhappiness, of negativity. That is what bad or evil means. Somebody who is positive, it will be easy for him to be mistapek, to be happy with what he has, to be content. Somebody who looks at things positive is usually not jealous, he's usually happy with whatever Hashem gives him. And so it's a beautiful, beautiful uh, uh, way of, not only a way of looking li at life, but a good disposition to be happy and content with whatever you have and not to be wanting of more and more and more. Because somebody who's wanting, that means he's lacking. If he's lacking, that means there's some negativity in him. What do you need all this for? Appreciate, yeah. Yeah. appreciate what you have. Look positively at life. So it so much depends on one's istaklut, klalit, his general uh, look or approach at life. Is it positive? This is nothing. This is only a means to an end. I'm sure you've heard the term, money should only be a means to an end, but not an end to itself. Because what do I need the money for? I need the money to pay the bills. That's all. That's, money really should be a means to an end. It's not an idol, right? But for some people it is. So to them, it's something that is lacking, that they need to get, they need to work so hard for. But for those who look positive at life, who look correctly at life, it, they will never have a feeling of lacking. Because he takes care of little ants, he little, takes care of all the dogs and cats. Hashem takes care of everybody, right? He's not going to take care of me. If I'm the crown of creation, man is the most important part of creation. He's not going to take care of me. He's going to give me whatever it is that I need. So that is the big difference between a good eye and a, and a bad eye. Now, what happens in, uh, in this world, this creation, is that all the evil forces that we talked about, the kishufim, the witchcraft, the evil eye, the negativity, they all gang up and gather in the same club. What I mean by that is the Kabbalah speaks about zakhar ve nekeva. I'm not going to get into that. It's a very deep topic. There are a lot of difficult terms in the Kabbalah of right, left, male, female, yin, yang, I think. Right? You may have heard these things. Yeah. Okay. That's uh, not important to us. But there are these, these things do exist in a certain uh, way. And the Tum'ah, all the kohot of the impurity, all the, of the forces of impurity, including that which is evil, including the evil eye, they all gather together in the same spot, in the same place. In other words, they all are in the same tree, in the same club. They all pretty much are attracted to the same thing. And I'll just give you a small little clue. I don't want to get into it too much because it may be misunderstood. A woman, when she's unclean, she's an ida, attracts to herself, whether she wants it or not, that's just a fact of life, impurities. And that is why in halakha, in Jewish tradition, there are certain sensitivities about a woman in that state. I won't say more than that. There are certain sensitivities. I, I hope most of you will understand what I mean. There are certain sensitivities as to where she can be and what she can do. Because of all that impurity that is there at a given time. Until, of course, it is removed through the mikveh. But the point is, I just gave you this as an example, is that they don't have to be invited. The impure forces, they go, they know where to go. They are in, they're pretty much attracted to the same spots, the same location, the same areas in the world. And in the same way that these kohot, these forces in the world can do harm, Every aspect of them, every part of them, is capable of causing harm. In other words, not just witchcraft, but even something like the evil eye, even something like simple tumah can be a problem. If tumah would not be a problem, if impurity would not be a problem, we wouldn't be washing our hands in the morning when we get up, even though that is a very low level tumah. Obviously, we take these things seriously. So what they all have in common is that they are harmful. They are not positive, they are negative, they belong to another camp. They're not nurturing like that which belongs to the good camp, that is positive, that is giving. They are limiting, they are wanting, they are restrictive, and they move you away 
from the ultimate mission that you're supposed to accomplish. They're there for a reason. Obviously, they are, they, they're there because we need a challenge. But we have to remember that we have to stay away from them because they are harmful. Okay, now that we, we were able to define what they are, let's take a look at harm. How does a human being cause harm? Well, man c can conduct himself in three ways. He can have thoughts, he can talk, and he can act, right? In these three modes of operation, he can also cause harm. All right. The easy one is maase. Physically, one can cause harm through his hands and feet. Slapping, kicking, we know that, right? So that's easy. Through the maase, through deeds, we know how people can cause others harm. How about dibur, speech? Can people cause others harm through speech? Lashonara, right? Gossiping, slander. What else? How about curses? Do you believe in that? Can somebody curse somebody? Well, if you didn't, you're going to find out how that is possible. How about blessings? Just like there are curses, there are blessings. You can do good or bad with your mouth. Okay? And then there's the eyes. Where do the eyes come in? With the thoughts. The eyes transmit the thought. Just like the hands and feet transmit the physical harm to somebody, our voice, our speech transmits a curse or blessing, right? Or lashonara through our dibur. The machshava, the thought process, how does it transmit any harm? Just by thinking about it? No, no, no. Through focusing. I think about it, or I think about certain things, and somehow the thought uses the vehicle called the eye to cause harm to others. Now, how does that happen? In reality, what is taking place? Well, rabbis tell us, it's brought down in the Zohar, that speech, the reason why speech is so dangerous is because when somebody says something bad, there are certain angels that listen to it, and they say, Amen. Let it be so. And that is what the rabbi tells, be very careful. Don't open your mouth to the Satan. In other words, don't curse yourself. Don't say anything negative about yourself, because a malach may be there present at that time when you say that, and he will say, oh yeah, Amen. Let it be so. You've just harmed yourself. And at a certain time, at any given moment, if a person says something, no matter who he is, he can harm somebody else through his speech. We're not even talking about slander and nashonara. We're talking about just a curse. It may happen. Words are powerful. Not because you're ruining the man's reputation. On a higher level, on a different level altogether, it could be that that particular moment, that individual is exposed. Why is he exposed? Because there's an accusation against him. He committed something terrible. He slapped a poor man in the face. All right? I'll give you an example. Not only did he not give him charity, he actually slapped him in the face and he told him, why don't you get yourself a job? Something very, very demeaning. Something very cruel. And this man is a man that has money. Of all people, you had to slap the poor man in the face. You had to demean him. So that causes an accusation. Above, they're very upset at him comes along this guy and gives him a curse. If that curse happened at the exact moment or around the time when there's an accusation, so that man is exposed, he's naked, in a sense, that curse will affect him. Same thing with a blessing. Rabbis tell us, don't take a blessing so lightly. Even if it comes from a simple man in the street, a homeless guy. If that is an etratzon, if that moment is a propitious time, and or that simple man has special yahus. His grandfather was a big rabbi in Sadiq. It just could be that if you haven't had children for 25 years, that man's blessing, not the rabbi's blessing, not the tzaddik's blessing, that simple man's blessing will come true. So ask everybody to bless you. From now on, ask everybody to bless you. You never know. And stay away from curses. You don't want anybody's curses. Because words are powerful. A curse, a blessing can come true. Okay? 
Now, in the same way that an angel is there to accept the blessing or the curse, in the same way it works, as Zohar says, with the evil eye. How does the evil eye work? So we're talking about an individual who has the ingredients of an evil eye. In other words, he's negative. He's wanting. He's not happy. Comes along a certain malach, mechabel, mashchit, a destructive kind of angel, and sits on his eye. That's how the Zohar explains it. Mitlabesh, or yoshev lo alayin. It sits on this man's eye, and wherever he looks, it causes destruction. It can cause destruction. There's a certain energy that leaves that eye, if we can call it energy, that harms whatever it sees. And when we say whatever, it means mamon or baguf. It can harm someone physically, and all of a sudden you feel, oh, you want to vomit. That is how you may, you may, it could be, it's not food poisoning. It could be somebody just gave you 10 minutes ago an eye nara. And you just feel like vomiting. You feel, your physical body feels terrible. Not a flu. Not nothing. You know you just didn't, you didn't eat anything wrong. You didn't, you didn't have any breakfast. Why are you feeling so terrible? It could be an ayinara. Because an ayinara can affect the physical body. Or it could affect one's finances. His job. His money. Why does it affect it? Why, how, does the eye, how does the eye affect it? On a Kabbalistic level, the way it happens is because make believe there is a, there is a tube. There is a pipe coming down from above into every soul, to every human being in this world. Just like we put food and drink into these two tubes here and air, the, the food pipe, the wind pipe, there is a spiritual tube through which we get shefa from above that keeps us alive, that keeps the neshama within this body. Comes along an aynara and what it does, it, it interferes, it disturbs this direct flow of abundance of shefa from above. And that is why all of a sudden we don't feel good or something goes wrong in our finances. This is very similar to somebody whose immune system is weak. What's going to happen? All of a sudden he's going to become sick. Something is wrong in the immune system that cannot fight back the bacteria or the virus or whatever it may be. Right? So therefore, an Ainara can attack and somehow it has the power to disrupt this shefa, and that is why a person all of a sudden feels the way he feels, or something goes wrong in his finances or in the family. Rabbis tell us that's why you have to be very careful not to expose yourself to all sorts of dangers and accusations. Anybody that goes to war, sometimes we have no choice, we're drafted. Then you're exposing yourself to danger, and what happens in the times of danger is that our books are opened. Our books are opened on Rosh Hashanah usually. That's the day of judgment. Not if you're in a dangerous place. Anytime a person goes through danger, he's asking for trouble because they open up his books. Should we make a miracle? Should we save him, protect him or not? They have to decide on the spot. They're not going to wait to Rosh Hashanah. You don't, there, you don't therefore want to take any risks, major risks, like uh, racing cars. It's a risk. Once you go into a racing car, you go mountain climbing, you do any, any, you're involved in any sport that is somewhat risky, your books are open. Because they may have to perform a miracle. And in order to perform a miracle, there has to be enough merits in the books. And if they're not, the, girl, the guy can get, get die. He was supposed to live to 99, <clears throat> and he went to 29. What a shame. <coughs> Now, sometimes we have no choice. We have to go through, we have to go to battle. A lot of Israeli soldiers, they don't have a choice. So what does Hashem do? That's next week's topic, I think next week. The guy, the flower was cut down short. Reincarnation. Gilgul brings them back. Born again. But this can happen. So you have to be careful of not exposing yourself to situations where an accusation... Uh, could uh, cause problems. Sorry, but yeah. Right. Right. How it is perceived? Any soldier that goes to protect Israel is a is a beautiful thing. I mean, it's a great mitzvah. He's protecting his countrymen. He's involved in something holy. 
the books are open because he's in danger. Anytime you are in a dangerous situation, the, it's like you're automatically opening your book, your books, you know, upstairs. What should we do with him? He's, should we protect him? There are hundreds of mines laying around. We have to basically lead him the way that he shouldn't step over them. War is dangerous. People lose their lives. So they have to make a decision who's going to remain alive. So in order to do that, in order to decide, they have to open the books. Somebody that's going through a, a, a triple bypass, that's a dangerous situation. Today, less than it was 20 years ago, but it's still dangerous. Open heart surgery. <laughs> right. Okay, usually the books are open on Rosh Hashanah, right? Rosh Hashanah is the day of judgment. What do we do for next year? Does everything remain status quo? We don't change his mazal? Do we improve it? Do we make it not as good? Rosh Hashanah is a time for decision, right? Now, there are other ways that a person can bring himself to court. You're, somebody does not have to sue you to take you to court. If you, if you drive without a license, you may end up uh, in court too, right? There are other things that can bring you to court, right? If a person talks about Shonara and others, he speaks bad about, about others, do you know what they say upstairs? The Satan says, he's talking? I want to talk about him too. So Lashonara brings you to court whenever you speak Lashonara. We don't wait for Rosh Hashanah. When somebody is in a dangerous situation, the same thing. They have to make a decision, should we save his life or not? He just put himself willingly or unwillingly in a dangerous situation. Should we protect him? Make a miracle or not? Does he deserve it or not? Or should we just let him go? Let him go. You know, he had his life, 20, 30, 40, whatever it was. Should we let him go? They have to make these decisions whenever people are in danger. Because whenever people are in danger, the books are open, there could be accusations. He doesn't deserve a miracle, or maybe he does. So this is a normal process. Stay away, if you can, from putting yourself in a dangerous situation. You don't know if they're going to make a miracle. You can't take a chance. You cannot rely on miracles. Yes? Is whether he merits a miracle or not, does that mean how many mitzvahs that person did? Or that like? No, only Hashem knows what is a big mitzvah or a small mitzvah, what is a mitzvah that can spare his life. It has nothing necessarily with the number of mitzvot. No, not number of mitzvot. Well, yeah. so yeah. Or, the, or, it, or it could be his father. Or it could be his father or grandfather was a, such a special man. Because of the merit of his father, they'll keep the son alive. There are various reasons why they... Oh, I need this man around. I need him around for some reason. I have a mission for him. that he, I can't let him go now. There's all sorts of reasons why Hashem needs... But they still have to open the books. They have to have a court session. Yeah. Is there a relation between the Shonara and Well, it's evil, right? They're both evil. A person actually who talks about others is, has a little bit of that negativity in him too because he looks down at others. He may be arrogant, but it's not exactly an Ainara, no. Not everybody has an Ainara. I want, I want to remind you that one thing that Baruch Hashem, most people don't have an evil eye. They don't. I'll, I'll get to that. I'll get to that. I'll get to that. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what that means soon. Will you talk about how we identify who that person in our midst might be, so we know how to protect ourselves? How to protect? Yeah. How to protect ourselves? Yes. The last few minutes, I'll talk about that. How to identify them? It's a little tough because some of them don't even know that they have it themselves. But usually, usually, if you detect, detect somebody who's very, very negative, envious, and looks at you as in a strange way, then you want to run away from them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everything okay? Yeah. yeah. So we'll talk about that at the end, yeah.
All right, so what do you do about not exposing yourself? So if it's danger, you don't go to a dangerous spot. But the rabbis tell us because we're surrounded with people who may give us an Ainara, and they may hurt us financially or may hurt us physically, so therefore, don't expose yourself to them. How do you not expose yourself to them? Well, if it's your money, don't talk about it. Rabbis tell us you want blessing? Don't talk about how much money you have. Don't talk about too much about how much money, how you make your money. Don't talk too much about your money. I mean, you a lot of tell people what you do for a living. I mean, you can't just you don't have to keep your mouth shut completely, but be careful not to emphasize it too much, not to draw attention. Don't get into details, unnecessary details. It's, if it's your family, I mean, it's different. We're talking about with people that you never know. So that is how one way to preserve the blessing, to have blessing, is cover up. Don't allow too many people to see what you have, what you own. Don't expose yourself. When we're talking about finances. Don't right, don't flaunt, yeah. Now, when we're talking about physical pain, physical harm, stay away. In other words, if you know somebody may give, may give Ainara, don't look at them in the face. Look away. Now the problem is, some people have real problem with this one, because if that individual is an aunt or an uncle, you know, how you look away? Hey, you have a problem. Yeah. Do your best. Do your best not to be around them. But I'll tell you what to do nevertheless if you're around them. Because sometimes it's hard to avoid them. But it, there's no doubt that one of the best things to do is to avoid and not to look them straight in the eye. Especially when you're doing well, you just want the lottery, or you just there was just a baby born in the family, especially your wife, your sister just became pregnant. And I, I need to remind especially the Persian people with this. If, if, the women, if you're pregnant, don't let anybody know. You know all of us, they, they want everybody to know. A lot of miscarriages occur because of that, because of Ainara. Don't let them know until it's almost impossible to hide it, you know, when you're six months. You know, then everybody will figure it out anyway. There's no mitzvah to tell everybody. Don't even tell your mother for a few months. Your mother and your mother-in-law try to hold the information for at least three, four months. At least. I'll tell you why. Not because they will give you an evil eye. Haz shalom. They're your mother and mother-in-law. But the women have a problem. They're going to tell everybody else. You see? Even if you tell them it's a secret, don't tell, every, don't tell nobody. They're still going to tell. It's very hard to hold such a secret. So from experience, I'm telling you this from experience, nothing wrong, I have nothing against women, right? But that's just the nature, that they, we will forget, somehow it will come out, somebody, somehow somebody will bring it, get it out of them. So don't tell it even to your closest friends. After a few months have elapsed, then slowly but surely break it to those who, who need to know. That's all. You want to cover up these things. Somebody that has an Ayn we said is lacking. Right? Somebody who is a good person is more complete, more shalem. Anybody who's more shalem doesn't really have to fear an Ainara. Because according to the Kabbalah, the more shalem a person is, the more complete he is, then the more of the tselem elokim, the more the image of God will be on him. And what happens when a person has the image of God on him, that gives out so much spiritual light that all the forces of evil run away from him. They don't... Rabbis tell us that a wild animal will not attack a human being unless she believes that that human being is an animal. Oh, that's good dinner for me tonight. You know, a shark, after it takes the first bite of a human being, it lets go. You know why? I thought this was a sea lion. I thought this was a fish. This is not part of his diet, so he lets go. The problem is, once he, once he took the first bite, there's so much blood loss that many people do not recover or survive. <laughs> right? Very few sharks just consume the entire human being. They just take a bite and they realize they let go. Why did they bite to begin with? Now, obviously, everything's been a shaman, but to them, it appears like a fish. A tiger attacks, a lion attacks. Oh, this is just another piece of uh, meat. But not Sadiqim. Sadiqim that were thrown to a lion's den. Daniel, many other Sadiqim who had a similar story. Go barayot, the lions, the lions were hungry, were not fed. They didn't touch the man. He had a tselem elokim. Anybody who perfects himself 
has no reason to fear of Anayin Ara because the, all the forces of evil run away from him. They don't get close to him. Same thing with one who protects himself with Torah, learns Torah. The demons do not come close to him. He's protected from Mazikim. Person who does Tzedakah, also Tzedakah can protect him at least at the moment that he's doing Tzedakah. The whole idea of giving Machzit a shekel, Am Yisrael gave half a shekel. This was a form of kapara, this was a form of protection from Ainara and from, also, or from all the evil spirits. The kapara, the tzedakah that a person does, at least at that time, can act as a safeguard against evil forces. Now we're going to just talk a little bit about what the rabbis tell us. The rabbis tell us that 99% of people die of Ain Hara, and one die of natural causes. What does that mean? Many people, when they learn this Gemara, they don't understand it well, because it's really more profound. What it really means, in a simplistic way, that 99 out of 100 die of Ain Hara, is that the Malach Mavet, the angel of death, or Samael, had to be involved. Because what, what is death? Death is something negative. Death is something that... Unfortunately, ever since Chet Adam Arishon, ever since from the very first sin, when man rebelled against God, it brought about this death, which is the falling apart, the breaking up of this human being, where the body goes to the grave and the Shema goes back to Hashem. That breaking up, that taking away the body, that putting that body into the ground and causing it to decompose, that is a part of that camp, the negative camp, the Ra, not the good, they have their share here. That body now becomes Tameh, unclean. They have their role to play in this death. When one is Shalem, when one is complete, he dies to what's called through Mitat Neshika, through kiss of Hashem. The Malach Mavit, the angel of death, is not involved. There's no, there's no real Tuma in a sense. A lot of big tzaddikim, their body did not even decompose. They've sanctified their body. They've become complete, complete. So therefore, they don't have an Ainara. It doesn't mean that an Ainara brought about their death, necessarily. It just means that the forces of evil are causing this to come. Now, it is true. You can say that because of all the Ainara that has accumulated over life, the various degrees of Ainara, some more, more heavy and some more less, that this little by little brings about an illness and brings about a weakness. But that is the, not the ultimate cause of death. The ultimate cause of death we all know is the Malach Mavet. He's the one that sholif. He draws the soul out and that's when the man ceases to exist, right? Unless it's a car accident or there's other sorts of situations where there's, that process is a little bit different. Nevertheless, Ainara basically means in that case the forces of evil have had an effect of bringing about the death of this individual. Whereas some, the rabbis talk about it, did not die be'etyo shel nachash. They did not die as a result of the sin or the advice of the nachash with Adam and Chava. Meaning what? They were complete. They were not into themselves. They were perfected. They were so pure that they did not die. They were taken from this world with HaKadosh Baruch Hu himself. Okay, real quickly, how do we protect ourselves from Ayn Hara? Well, first of all, you know fish are not affected by Ayn Hara. That is one of the blessings that Yaakov gave before he passed away to Yosef, to Yosef's children. They, they should multiply like fish. In other words, there should be no Ayn Hara. Why is there no Ayn Hara, evil eye on fish? So one explanation given is because they are covered by water, by water. They are not really seen. Remember we spoke about covering everything up? And isn't it interesting that they don't have eyelashes? Or what? Eyelids. I'm sorry, eyelids? Yeah. They don't need to cover their eyes. Right? It's interesting. But anyway, fish do not have an eye-eye. And you know what's so good about that? Fish actually received a blessing in creation. Hashem knew that the Japanese are going to want a lot of sushi. So I have to make a lot of fish. They're going to be overhunted. And I can't allow them to go extinct. They need sushi. So therefore, the fish receive the beracha. They have a beracha. Therefore, no matter how much you hunt them, 
there are always going to be fish in this world. Not so animals that went extinct. You know how many mammals and animals and birds become extinct? In this century alone, there was a tiger called the Caspian Tiger in Iran, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, Eastern Turkey, and, and, and parts of, uh, of Uzbekistan also. That whole area around the Caspian Sea. A Caspian tiger looked a little bit different than the other tigers. It's no longer around. The last one was shot in 1959. Yeah, I can give you a whole list of animals that have become extinct. Are there, there, are, there are no lions in Israel today. Only a few leopards left. All right? Animals can become extinct. Dinosaurs became extinct. The mastodon, the mammoth became extinct. There are many animals that have become extinct. Anybody here ever heard of the dodo bird? It's not around. As long, I mean, as far as we know, it's not. Animals can become extinct because they don't have a beracha. And if they're overhunted, there's disease or other problems, then nature takes its course. It's going to happen one way or another. Hashem did not promise that they're not they're going to be around forever. He only promised that the Jewish people are going to be around forever. That, yes, but not everybody else. A lot of nations disappear too. Fish are around. So in fish, there's no Ainara, there's nothing that can harm them really. What's so special about fish? Not because Japanese need it. That's, that's just, a, just a joke. But fish are pure. They are on a purer level than the rest of the animal kingdom. And that is why they don't require shahita. You don't need to slaughter a fish. You just take it out of water and you bang it on the head because you, you can't eat it raw, right? I mean, alive. And uh, once it's dead, you're allowed to eat it, however you want it. Well made, raw, whatever you want. A fish is purer, and because it's pure, it does not require the tikkun of shahita. Shahita is a form of tikkun for the animal. That's another subject. Okay? And therefore, because they're purer, guess what? That's next week's topic, but I'll tell you a little bit now. Sadiqim, when they have to come, the Gilgun and reincarnation, many of them come in a fish. There's even a fish in Vienna, Austria, in one of the old cemetery. There's a sem there's a there is a monument, a matseva in the form of a fish. My grandfather saw it. And he says, What's this? So he went to the Pinkasa Keila. He went to see the story behind this matseva. What's this fish? And he read there the story. Not too long ago, somebody bought a fish for Shabbat. And he, as soon as he began to cut it out, to cut up the fish, all of a sudden he hears a voice, Shema Israel. So he took the fish to the rabbi. What's this? Now, if, if he would have asked me, I would have said, Say Shakol Niyabit Varon, have it for Shabbat. This is, you know, beautiful mitzvah. Forget about the voice. The rabbi, for some reason, told him it's a, it's a neshama of some sort of tzaddik, maybe. Go ahead and bury it. And just for, for everybody to know that this happened, they put a matseva, a tombstone of a fish. Anyway, there's another story, but I'll tell you next week. That's, that's next week's topic. But anyway, so the king can come in reincarnation into a fish. A fish is purer. Okay, so what do we do for, uh, for Ainara? How do we protect ourselves? We can't avoid the people. We know some of them. We suspect them. Okay, one idea is if you wear a linen clothing, pure white, all linen, no wool, no polyester, no nothing, Ainara cannot affect people who are completely dressed in pishtan lavan, in white linen. Paro wore only white linen. He, was, he didn't want to be affected by witchcraft or any evil forces. Yosef also was aware of that. But yeah, Paro did not know that Yosef knows this trick. So Paro, when he saw Yosef coming to him with white linen, what does he do? He takes out Revida Zahab. I want you to wear this beautiful gold necklace too. Because he, he shouldn't be like him. Yosef, of course, didn't want to uh, insult him. But as soon as he came home, he took it off. Because they knew this, the trick of avoiding the evil eye and all sorts of evil forces to wear white linen. Anyway, most of us today have a little bit of a hard time because of style and everything to wear just white linen. So I'm going to have to give you something else to do. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's the coin used to wear white right. The coin goggle used to wear that. He's right. Dead people, dead people white sure. White. That's right. They have what to fear. The dead people have a lot what to fear. Yeah. Okay. What do we do for zgulot? Zgulot are special remedies for Ainara. 
There are special remedies to protect one from Ayn and there's, there's some remedies to eliminate or to remove in case you were affected. The ones to remove, I can't go with you. I can't go over them because they're long and there's, they have to be set at a certain time. But there are, I just want to assure you that in case anybody was affected, there are ways to remove them. But we can't go over them right now. But as far as protecting yourself, you see somebody you encounter, you suspect that this one may have an Ayn What you say is the pasuk that Yaakov told Yosef. Ben porat Yosef, ben porat ale'ayn, banot sa'ada aleshur. That first pasuk. After that, you add what the rabbis suggest to add, just to make it stronger. Yosef ka'atina de la bisha. I come from the seed of Yosef, on whom the evil eye does not affect. If you want it, I'll tell it to you later. I'll write it down for you. This is pretty strong. Say it right away. And don't yell at them when you say it, so they shouldn't think you're saying, you know, what are you saying? But, you know, say it to yourself. The, the blue color, they say, is very helpful, blue. And I wonder if that has to do something with why the Arabs paint their homes in green. Because maybe they thought it's green. But anyway, blue is the real color, not green. Yeah, it's not green, it's blue. The easiest thing to do is not to show off, not to talk too much, and not to attract too much attention. Because of this, there's a halakha, the two brothers or father and a son should not have an aliyah to the Torah, one after the other. It's drawing attention. Oh, two brothers, oh, two. You know, father, son. That's who there is a halakha concerning Ainara. Be careful, don't do that. And we actually follow the halakha. Even if the brothers say, no, 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 it's okay. No, we don't let them. We're concerned about this Ainara. Now, be careful with uh, all these things that are superstition from goyim, knock on wood. That's not Jewish, and don't do it. That's called Darchea Mori, and it's a surah according to the Lacha. The red string that people get from Kever Rachel, all, all it really is, it's not just somebody made it up to make some money. You know, here's some red string. All it is is because, what, what is the red string? Have you ever been to a bullfight? I hope not, because it's a sur to go to a bullfight. Because that's so cruel, and it's what the goyim do. Nevertheless, what happens in a bullfight, I'm sure you've seen, what does the man show the bull? Red, uh... red. Why red? It attracts him. A red string is supposed to distract the evil eye, to look at the red string and not to look at the person. If, it's, if it succeeds in doing that, I don't know. But that's what it really is all about. It's to cause a distraction from the person looking at you, looks at the red. At the red. Does it work? I don't know. It's, look at the string and don't look at the person. Because I, we're concerned about looking at the eyes, right? So if it looks at the string, no harm should come from it. Does it work? I'm not sure. But you want to wear it? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Now, there are some people that will tell you after hearing all this, hey, I heard that if you don't believe in this stuff, it doesn't affect you. It's not true. That statement of if you do not believe in it, it will not affect you, does not concern Ayn Ara. It concerns other things. The Gemara does talk about certain things that if you do not believe in them, you're not concerned about them, then they won't go after you. It's not, uh, evil eye is not included in that. Evil eye affects everybody. There's so many halachot, so many statements by Kabbalah, Zor, Gemara, that you should be concerned about it, that you, you have to be concerned about it. There's a whole sugya, a whole portion in the Gemara that talks about the following problem. A man going by his friend's field, and this is the time of the year where the kama, the wheat is growing. Do not stare into that man's field as all the stalks of wheat are beautifully growing. Why? Because hezek reya shmei hezek, or shalav shmei. There's a whole discussion in the Gemara. It, I may cause damage by staring in a man's field that is so beautiful, growing and over, overflowing with wheat. That, I may cause harm. So do not look at your friend's field when it's overflowing with so much beautiful wheat. Because you're looking at it may harm it. It may spoil, it may rot. Something may, something's going to happen and he's going to have a loss because of you looking at it. What do we see from all of this? That of course there is something called Ainara that you have to be concerned about. You have to be careful. And, and if you suspect somebody has it, stay away. Don't stand out. Don't talk to them too much. And if you can't avoid him, then of course say whatever you can say. Or do Hamsa Hamsa. Uh, I'll tell you where Hamsa comes from. 
I think the way the reason Hamza is is adapted by the Sephardim because in the Sefer Zgulot, there's a book about Zgulot, but all sorts of remedies. It is brought down that what is, is very protective of one is a hay made of silver if you wear it on you. So they may have used that as Hamza with the with the hand with the five fingers. So I'm not a hundred percent sure that the Hamza of the hand really helps, but the hay in the silver does have certain powers. A, silver, a piece of silver made in the shape of a, the letter hay, if you wear it on you, that can also be somewhat of a protection. Yeah. yeah. No, it's everywhere, the whole world, the whole world. Yeah, I know, Eisen, I know, sure, sure, yeah. Now, there are some people who are unaware that they have Ainara. So my best advice to them is to anybody, actually to all of us, is the best thing is to work on oneself to develop a positive eye. As the Pasuk says, Tov Ein Hu A good eye who sees positive at everything, he himself will be blessed. You want to be blessed, then look at things positively. Be happy with what you have. Don't be jealous of everybody else. Don't... Look at what everybody else, uh, else has. Just be happy. Develop a positive attitude, a positive eye. In this way, you will be a, you'll be hopefully retraining yourself not to have a negative eye. Okay, just as a final note, we spoke a lot about the dangers of an evil eye, the negativity that an evil eye has, uh, how people look at life. The eye is a powerful organ. This eye causes many people a lot of trouble in life, whether it's jealousy, whether it's that they covet something, or whether it's because they look at life the wrong way. In the same way that the eye causes so much trouble and brings down people, the eye is also the source of holiness. If one is careful with his eyes, shmirata inayim as it's called, if one is very careful with what he looks at, does not look at forbidden things, whether it's women or anything else that is forbidden, that is not for him, right? He's able to grow in, in, in a tremendous way. The highest levels of kedusha, of holiness, rabbis tell us, are attained, especially through Shmirat Ainaim. Anybody who's very careful with what his eyes are allowed to see will be gifted with Ruach HaKodesh, will be able to have tremendous uh, vision, uh, you know, of uh, knowing things of the future, and knowing things about other people, because of that level of holiness that he has gotten to. And that is, of course, the meaning of it. If you sanctify yourselves, if you do things that are holy, if you look at things positively, you watch your eyes, and you basically attach yourself to holiness, then Bezat Hashem, you will be furthest and furthest away from the Tum'ah. The Tum'ah will not affect you. And on the contrary, you will be able to work with the forces of holiness. Because in the same way that there are forces of impurity that can cause harm, there are forces of good that can cause a lot of good. All the miracle, all the miracle makers, all the tzaddikim, all the great people that we've had who were able to bless, who were able to see and give advice, where did it all come that? Where did it all come from? They drew that from the Kedushah. They drew that from holiness. A lot of people may do things like tarot cards, Crystal ball gazing, and we'll be talking about that too, that it's forbidden. All of that is drawn from impure forces, and it's not always accurate either. You want to go to people who are reliable, to people who are drawing their koach from the klusha, from the pure forces, the forces of purity. And, the, and rabbis tell us, it's brought down to Tanat Veliyao, that anybody can reach those levels, man or woman, Jew or non-Jew. All the kolefi ma'asav, ruach ha-kodesh depending on what their deeds are like, Ruach HaKodesh can reside on them. Anybody, man or woman, Jew or non-Jew, that's incredible. Depending on how the, their deeds are, that is what they will be drawn to. What that means is that even a non-Jew, if he's drawn to holiness, he can become holy. Of course, those who are really drawn eventually convert because they feel a certain attraction to that which is divine. There's a certain spark in their soul that is thirsty for divinity and it's attracted like a magnet. But we have to remember that we all have free will. And because we have this free will, we're always going to be challenged as to which camp we want to join. Hopefully, Bezat Hashem, we will join the camp of Dusha.